It is the 29th of June 1995 and a luxury six year old department store will be the centre of one of the world's most deadly structural failures not involving a terrorist attack. The event will serve as a stark warning against quick urbanisation of cities and the importance of proper building use consideration. The collapse of the Sampung department store in Seoul would be the largest peacetime disaster in South Korean history, killing 502 people and injuring 937. As such, I'm going to rate it here 7 on my plainly difficult disaster scale, but here 8 on my legacy scale, as the perpetrators of the event would actually be made to pay for their negligence. It is the 1980s and South Korea is enjoying an economic boom. Although the country politically is under the control of military strongman Chu Du Hwan, it will towards the end of the decade move towards democracy. The country is experiencing great expansion of heavy industries, electronics and steel industries with the backing of the government. This is part of the miracle on the Han River where the country hurtled itself to be the 11th largest economy in the world. Towards the end of the decade, Seoul hosts the 1988 Summer Olympics and the success of this on the international stage makes the city even more of a world destination. As such, the nation's capital develops at a lightning pace, stretching the country's construction companies to breaking point. This is further exasperated by bans against international contractors signing contracts for projects in Seoul. In 1987, riding on the wave of success in Seoul leading up to the Olympics, ground was broken for a new building. The construction project is based in Silcho district, an area in the southern part of the city. The building is to be built across land that used to be used as landfill, but is now prime real estate, ideal for a modern apartment block. The building will be a relatively straightforward four-storey apartment block to be built by Wusong Construction. However, this original plan wouldn't last long as the lead of Sampong Group's construction division, Lee Jun, decided that a change of use would make the project more profitable. This would involve turning the building into a department store. The change necessitated significant amendments to the plan to the building to accommodate a central escalator system. But instead of recalculating the loads on each floor, June's team made some adjustments to the blueprints. The building was designed without a steel skeleton. Instead, each concrete floor would be supported by the columns without the use of horizontal beams. This method is known as flat slab construction. The use of this style of construction aids in speed of completion, ease of installing sprinklers and utilities, and other piping, as well as cost. But with the ease comes some serious downsides and that is the construction of large spans is more difficult and the size of the support column is vital. Throughout the central portion of the building each floor was to be supported in the original plans by multiple concrete columns 80 centimeters in diameter with 16 22 millimeter diameter reinforcing steel bars within. But in order to accommodate the escalators and maximize retail space Eight columns were reduced in size to 60 centimeters with only eight 22 millimeter reinforced bars. This was not liked by Wusong Construction, which led to the company being dropped and Sampung completing its project in-house. The original 80 centimeter diameter columns meant that their spacing was set at 11 meters apart. Widening that gap with smaller pillars would push the building beyond its limits but that would not be the end to the modifications from Sampung. To further optimize the plot of land for a new department store, a fifth floor was envisioned for a roller skating rink, a relatively lightweight addition to the already strained building. But yet again, the plan was changed. Gone was the lightweight use of the top floor, but instead a food court was posed. The equipment needed for such a plan would greatly push the limits to the building past breaking point but the construction continued. Not only that, but a Korean style of underfloor heating, known as ondo, was specified for the fifth floor. This would include a concrete floor with heavy heating pipes running within. The original plans for level five had a calculated predicted load 
of 1,040 kilograms per square meter, but a new configuration had 1,530 square meters, nearly a 50% increase in weight strain on the already minimalized supporting columns. The supporting columns didn't line up throughout the building, leading to the load having to be transferred along the concrete floor slabs. To add even more load on the already stressed design, three 15-ton air conditioning units were installed on the roof, creating a 45-ton load that was four times originally envisioned. This was another side effect of the change of use for the building, as originally the design wasn't intended to have such large air conditioning units. Not only the weight caused the stress on the building, but the vibrations themselves generated from the units. Nevertheless, the trouble project was completed in late 1989, seeing its first guests on the 7th of July 1990. Around 40,000 people per day would visit the bustling shopping mall, attracting lunchtime customers from the nearby business district, earning its business owners around 4 million US dollars per week. Around 1,000 people were employed in its day-to-day -day running, and business is booming. Cooling towers on the building were installed on the side next to an apartment building. Shortly after opening, complaints started to come in to the department store's management. Instead of hiring a crane to move this heavy cooling structure, rollers were used and the 45-ton tower was dragged across the roof. This yielded some results, a cheaper and easier move, but also caused significant damage to the roof as the weight rolled across. Along came 1995 and some worrying signs started to appear around the fifth floor at the Sampung department store. Racks started to appear during April in the ceiling of the south wing. What should have been a major red flag was only met with a minor reaction from management, in which staff were told to move the merchandise and stores from the top floor to the basement. The cracking around the south wing would continue to increase, accelerated by vibrations of the aircon tower. It is the 29th of June 1995 and a department store opens as usual. Hundreds visit the building but above their heads in the fifth floor ceiling the cracking continues to worsen. In the morning cracks in the area had increased dramatically prompting managers to close parts of the top floor. No evacuation was ordered and customers although inconvenienced by the closure carried on shopping as normal. However executives for the company did evacuate as a precaution but to avoid a loss of a day's revenue, management carried on as usual. This would still be the case when engineers were called up to investigate the cracking. After only a short check, it was revealed that the building was at risk of collapse, and yet the building stayed open. Around lunchtime, loud bangs and cracks could be heard from the fifth floor as the concrete separated from the columns. By now, customers were complaining about severe vibrations throughout the building. To alleviate the concerns, management switched off the aircon, but the damage had already been done. A 10 cm wide crack had appeared on the fifth floor, with collapse all but guaranteed an emergency board meeting was held. Many argued for the closing and the evacuation of the building, but Lee June insisted the store stayed open. However, Lee himself left the building. At around 5pm, the fifth floor was completely closed off as the roof began to sink but the rest stayed open. The decision to completely evacuate was taken at 5.50 p.m., but this was too late. At 5.52 p.m., the Sampung department store collapsed. The weakened roof gave way, sending the air conditioning units crashing through the overstressed fifth floor. The south wing pancaked, crushing each subsequent floor below it, trapping over 1,500 people within the rubble. Rescue crews were on scene within minutes, frantically trying to rescue anyone trapped within. Heavy lifting equipment would arrive the next day, but rescue efforts would be called off from fears of further collapsing in the area. To alleviate the fears of further damage from the structure, the remains of the store were steadied by guy cables. A week after the collapse, focus changed to clearing the structure, but survivors were discovered as late as 17 days post-disaster. A survivor who was pulled free nine days after collapse described to rescuers that many had died drowning in the water sprayed on the structure for fire suppression. 
In total, 502 people lost their lives at the department store collapse. The event shocked the nation, even prompting President Kim Jong Sam to visit the wreckage site. As such, an investigation panel was set up to find out how the Sampung department store collapsed and who was to blame. Professor Lang Chung from Dankook University's engineering school was chosen to head up the investigation. Initially, a gas explosion was thought to be the culprit. Even more worrying was the culprit of a terrorist attack. Although the pancaking collapse with little debris ejected suggested the failure was more due to structural issues. After investigating plans and drawings of the building, a number of key issues were discovered with the design. The flat slab construction was highly criticised, as it didn't have reinforcing beams, instead relying on the column to hold the slab in place. Too small of a column will result in it punching through the flat slab, and this problem is exasperated if the weight the columns need to support is increased, just like level 5 at the Sampoon department store. The investigation summarised the cause of the collapse in four points. The changes in design and increase in load upon changed design was the key cause of the disaster. The building was constructed poorly, using improper concrete mixing and poorly reinforced ceilings and walls. Inadequate building and structural planning using a flat slab construction was a factor that caused the progressive collapse. Slabs on the 5th floor and the roof floor in the vicinity of the 5E pillar and 5F pillar experienced sheer failure, eventually along the circumference of the pillars. This is believed to lead to destruction of adjacent slabs, which is a progressive collapse, ending up with the destruction of the entire building, potentially caused by the movement of the air conditioning units. What sets this event aside from many I've covered is that the driving force behind the disaster did actually meet some kind of justice. On the 27th of December 1995, after some incriminating statements made during the collapse investigation, Lee Jun was found guilty of criminal negligence and received a prison sentence of 10 and a half years, later reduced to 7 and a half. Lee Jun's son, who was also the store's CEO, Lee Han Sang, received seven years for accidental homicide and corruption. Others would also be sentenced for crimes relating to bribery and building regulations violations, and would include local government officials as well as company executives. The Sampoon Group, two months post-disaster, agreed to sign all of its money and assets over to the victims for compensation, which would result in a total of around 300 million US dollars being paid out to 3,293 cases. Ironically, the land was cleared and in the early 2000s, turned into luxury apartments. This is a Plaintiff Court production. All videos on the channel are Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike licensed. Plaintiff Court videos are produced by me, John, in a not very sunny southeastern corner of London, UK. Help the channel grow by liking, commenting, and subscribing. Check out my Twitter for all sorts of photos and odds and sods, as well as hints on future videos. I've got Patreon and YouTube membership as well, so check them out if you fancy supporting the channel financially. And all that's left to say is thank you for watching. <laughs>